Well, I am delighted to say that uh, joining me on the Godcast today is Philip Baldwin. Now, Philip is a human rights activist. He was born in 1985, and in 2010, he was diagnosed with HIV. Philip is a healthy man. He's happy and successful. He's a Christian, and uh, we're going to find out a little bit more about him now. So, Philip, it's uh, lovely to welcome you to the Godcast. How are you today? I'm good, and thank you very much for having me on the Godcast. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you. Where, whereabouts are you today, Philip? Where's home? I, I live in central London. I, I actually grew up in the north of England uh, on the edge of the Lake District and, and then uh, went, went to school in Edinburgh. I would say having grown up in the Lake District, I'm actually someone who's always been drawn to urban environments. A lot of my friends, like, um, they, they aspire to live in the countryside, but I, I feel like I've had my fair share of the countryside. <laughs> okay, well, well tell, us, tell us a bit more about that, Philip. Tell us about young life for Philip. Was it, was it um, what age did you leave the Lake District? Uh, uh, when I was about 10, I, I, I went to a school in Edinburgh and it had, uh, it, it did have a faith basis to it. So we would attend church in church services in the morning, and we would also attend church on a Sunday. Um, however, for me, at this point in my life, faith, to be honest, it, it wasn't really much more than a as early as my um, as early as my teens, I really didn't think that Christianity um, was more than a, a, a formality. I, 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 I would, at, at that age, I would have described myself uh, as an atheist or an agnostic. And that was something that continued throughout my early 20s really, uh, really un uh, until my HIV diagnosis. And, and subsequently moving to Edinburgh, so that was your formative teenage years, would that have been in Edinburgh? Yes, uh, I was bullied uh, when I was at school and that, that had quite a large impact on me. Uh, at that point, I was coming to terms with my sexuality as a gay man, I the first person who I came out to was my friend Fiona when I was 16. She was very supportive and affirming of my sexual orientation, but most people in my school weren't. Um, I would overall describe myself as being very geeky and introverted. Uh, during this period of my life. And it wasn't really until I started at university that I became the out and proud gay man that I am today. So, so coming out at 16, Philip, can I ask how, how long did you delay that disclosure to Fiona? Were, were you aware of your sexuality long before that? Or, or just, t just tell us about that if you would. That is actually a really interesting question because it's quite hard to pinpoint. Uh, I, I go into schools uh, with a charity called Stonewall where I speak about my own coming out experiences and my journey with faith. And I, I sometimes get asked that by the young people, you know, when did you first realize you were a gay man? And it would probably be between the ages of 12, 12 and 14. I think by, by the age of 14, I knew, but I was too frightened to tell anyone. Um, around the age of 12, I was, um, I was certainly, certainly that was, that was beginning to be, the way that I perceived myself. But if we go back to, uh, to 
I would say that, that this would be around 1997, 1998. We were living in a very different society. So there was a real lack of LGBTQ plus role models in the media. So it was, it, it, it was or, or, or in society generally, uh, we only had one or two um, openly gay MPs. Um, as I mentioned, I, I, I think at the time, probably the only, the only two LGBTQ plus people who were regularly on television were Graham Norton and Ian McKellen. So th there weren't really many, many role models. M my parents didn't know anyone who was gay S and the atmosphere within my school was quite homophobic. So it, it, it wasn't really until, um, until I started uh, exploring um, exploring the gay scene in my late teens and when I came out at university that I really realised what it was like um, to be a gay man. You, you talked about the, the troubles of, of school. What about family? How did they respond to you coming out as a gay man? Was, was that easy a transition for them or not? Well, something that I often say is that when it comes to coming out as LGBTQ+, it can often be hardest to tell the people you love the most. So for me, I, I came out to my close friends. Um, I came out to, um, to, uh, to my peers at university. And it wasn't until about a year later that I actually told my parents. I'd been very anxious about how my parents would react to my, uh, to my sexual orientation. Uh, ultimately, they were very accepting. And that was, um, that was very important to me. Um, so I was fortunate in that sense. But it, 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 it was something which, uh, which I really worried about for years. Mm. And subsequently, university life um, led you into work. How did that come about, Philip? What was your pathway into the, the working environment from university? Well, I, I ended up ultimately um, working in financial services um, in in the city and th that happened as a consequence of uh, work experience um, whilst I was still at, at university. Um, this was a different era. Uh, we're talking 2006, 2007. It was before the financial um, crisis of 2008 and 2009. And back then the law firms and banks would actually visit universities and um, they, 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 they used to try and poach you if they, if they thought you were academically gifted or worked hard. Um, I did work experience with a large law firm. I thought this seems like a great career path and I signed up for that. And um, I, 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 I started working um, at, a, at a law firm uh, in London's financial district in 2009. And I continued working there until 2015. I, I wouldn't say that I have any regrets about that. F for me, that was probably a useful thing for me to do during my 20s. Um, I really gained a lot of independence through that. Um, the law firm actually sent me to New York in 2011 uh, for six months on secondment. It was wonderful living in New York. But um, following my HIV diagnosis, 
um, in, in 2010, that really initiated a process of me starting to reevaluate my life. And by 2015, um, I, my, um, my campaigning and activism had really snowballed. And I felt that that was the direction that my life and, and also uh, the, the, I, I felt that that was where God was calling me. Okay, and um, you, you mentioned there that about HIV. Philip, could you, could you break down some of the stigma and the uh, misrepresentation and misassociation with HIV? Are, are you happy to share with us how that diagnosis came about? And, and you know, what, what symptoms were you demonstrating? What led you to believe that this could be an issue? Um, again, that, that, that's another really interesting and, and important question. So uh, thank you for asking that. Um, there is still a, a lot of misinformation uh, around HIV. So my HIV diagnosis actually took place over my lunch break from work. Um, I um, had no idea that I was um, HIV positive. I'd been tested in 2009 and um, all the results had come back um, negative. I, I'd not only been tested for HIV, but also for, um, for a range of other STIs. And I, I, I used to go to the sexual health clinic uh, approximately every six months. Um, that was something that um, the, uh, I, that uh, had been uh, impressed on me by, um, uh, but when I had first visited um, an STI clinic um, in my late teens, that as a gay man, I was in an at-risk group. So it would be good for me to test regularly. In, in 2009, um, I was completely healthy. And that was what I thought, um, th that was what I thought would happen in 2010, that I would walk into the clinic and that, that an hour later I would emerge uh, with uh, ha having been told um, that, I, that I was clear for, for all STIs. It came as a complete shock to me uh, when I was diagnosed with, with HIV. Um, I didn't just feel shocked, I, 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 I felt anger, uh, I, I felt grief. It, it seemed as if everything that I'd worked so hard for, for all those years, um, had potentially been thrown away. And at, at that time, I wasn't very well informed around HIV myself. Something that I should emphasize is that HIV really isn't a death sentence any longer. Uh, I take one tablet a day. I'm completely healthy. Uh, I, I can ex anticipate a normal lifespan. I, um, uh, the medication is side effect free and I can't pass HIV on to any of my sexual partners or any sexual partners because um, the HIV virus is suppressed uh, uh, within my body by the medication. So in lots of ways, um, HIV now doesn't, it, it, it doesn't impact uh, me physically, but there is still a huge burden in terms of the stigma of HIV. Um, for a lot of people, um, they, they don't realize the medical advances that you can live normally and healthfully. So that's something that I still try to reiterate as much as possible. I've, I've lost the...
I've actually lost the audio at 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 your end. Yeah. So just just when you got that diagnosis, Philip, just share with us. You know, obviously you've got this physical diagnosis, but the um, did you mentally feel the stig- stigma that was attached to HIV? What did that do to you as an individual? It took me about three years to come to terms with my HIV diagnosis. The first year following the diagnosis was particularly hard. I was continuing to go into the office and in the office, I was projecting a facade that everything was okay. Um, I would leave work and then it would really hit me. Um, I was trying to learn as much as possible about the virus. Uh, I was, I had multiple uh, doctor's appointments, which I was uh, juggling with my work. And during during this period, I, um, I, I really went through a phase of um, of anxiety and, um, and and at times a really deep depression. Um, my at some points my life felt completely hopeless. Um, th- there were a number of turning points where things began to improve. Um, at the beginning of two thousand eleven. Um, I had a relationship with another man who was HIV positive and that really helped because he he was living a normal and happy life and it also allowed me to it, it enabled me to know that I could love and be loved in return again. And that was something following my HIV diagnosis, which really troubled me. I was really concerned that no one would would love me again. Gosh. A second factor was that uh, in in 2011, was that I began to access uh, peer support around HIV. So there wasn't just this individual that I was dating, but I was also speaking to other people who were living with HIV and speaking to other people who had encountered the same challenges that I had and had overcome them um, really empowered me. Hmm. But I would say that a third and possibly uh, with hindsight, one of the key factors um, or the major factor was that um, from the beginning of 2012, I increasingly began to attend churches uh, near my workplace. Initially, I just went there um, over, um, I would just pop in for 30 minutes um, if I needed to escape the office. It was just because I wanted to savour the sense of tranquility. Um, I'd always been interested in art and architecture. So that was also a factor which, which, which drew me to these places. I just wanted to sit down somewhere. Um, I would look at the the architecture, uh, but after a number of months, I began to realize that there was more to these places than just columns, cornices, architraves, stained glass. There was something really special there. Um, Towards the end of 2012, I was sitting in St. Lawrence uh, Jewelry, which is near the Guildhall in central London. It's a church which was designed by Sir Christopher Wren. 
And uh, one of the church wardens very kindly gave me one of their Bibles. It's a Bible that I still have to this day. And I would just find myself in the evenings when I'd returned home from the office, I would just find myself opening it and reading passages from it. And that really, um, that was one of the factors where I would say my, which, which caused my, my faith to grow. I was becoming more curious mm -hmm. in, in Christianity. Over the course of 2013, I then began to visit more churches. I, um, my office um, was, uh, as I mentioned, based, based in the financial district. And I literally just worked my way through a swathe of central London along the churches on, mm. on Fleet Street. Um, not necessarily always Church of England churches. Mm. Um, I visited some Catholic churches um, as well. Um, and also um, I, I went to some churches um, which are part of other Christian denominations. Yeah. I, I, I enjoyed visiting these places, but, and at, at, at times I had some very moving spiritual experiences, experiences where I would say that, that I did actually feel very close to Jesus, but those experiences were really limited to when I was within those faith spaces. It wasn't until early 2014 that I stumbled across a church in Waterloo called St. John's. And that was headed by a openly gay priest um, called Giles Goddard. He's, uh, he's well known within the Church of England. Uh, I appreciate that your, your podcast gets a really broad range of listeners. So uh, just to put that in context for them, he was on General Synod, the Church of England's uh, equivalent of, uh, of a parliament where, where, where both uh, myself and, and, and yourself, Alex, are now, um, are now members. Yeah. Um, so, so Giles was an established figure within the church. He was openly LGBTQ+. And I stumbled across this really amazing faith setting. And what Giles did, which I hadn't really encountered in the churches that I visited in 2013, is that Giles really got me involved in the life of the church. So he had me doing uh, altar service. Um, I was helping out with their, um, with their homeless project. Um, they were, um, he, he tried to get me involved in, in the choir. Um, they had a, um, a, a, a youth group. Um, uh, at the time I was, um, I, I think I was in my, uh, I was probably around 28 or, 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 or 29 then. Mm. Uh, and it was really nice to meet other Christians, my own age, who yeah. were also, um, who were also LGBTQ plus. Yeah. And, uh, and as well as that, Giles was a key figure. Um, Philip, can I, and Philip, can I, can I ask you, Philip, did, did that church setting give you something in terms of relationship? I think there's something in here about relationships. Did that church setting with Giles give you something about a relationship that you maybe you'd felt through the experience of uh, being diagnosed with HIV in your workplace? Can you just say anything about that, please? 
So I, prior to my HIV diagnosis, um, so prior to, to the diagnosis in 2010, I would really say that I had grown into an out and proud gay man. Um, I had everything really, a successful career, um, a, um, a, a really beautiful city center apartment. Um, a lot of things in my life had gone really to plan. Um, I, I, I had an incredible circle of friends, but following my HIV diagnosis, I was left with, I was left feeling really isolated. Mm -hmm. um, I felt isolated from, um, from, from a lot of my gay friends who were HIV negative on account of my, um, on account of my HIV, I felt isolated from my work colleagues because I felt, um, I felt that I couldn't tell them about my HIV diagnosis mm. because I was worried at that point that it might impact my career. And also um, at, at that time, I didn't have the confidence to tell my parents mm. because I, I didn't want to alarm them. Um, back in 2010, I, I didn't really know what the implications of HIV were going to be for me. And so I, th there are actually very few people who I could confide in. I went through a process of coming to terms with my HIV diagnosis and um, the, the community that I found at St. John's, in some ways, it was the culmination of that. Um, I learned, um, I gained not just acceptance around myself, mm -hmm. but I also learned about how I could use some of the um, some of the gifts that I had been given in terms of my um, my education, the skill sets that I that I had developed um, at university mm. and and as a lawyer, I, I I learned how I could give back to other people, and that sense of community um, that I at St. John's, um, the support of the congregation, um, it really helped me to grow as a person. And yeah, Philip, in, in, um, you, you kind of, um, you, you are clearly a highly intelligent and articulate individual. I want to ask you um, about why did you join the Church of England? <laughs> and, and what I mean by that is when you when you joined the church, was it that church that you joined? Or were you fully up for becoming an Anglican and and and, and being as articulate and as intelligent you are, you would know that the Church of England was perhaps not known for its uh, welcoming and acceptance of of gay people. Just just go through that a little bit for me, please. I think living in London, I am fortunate um, in that there are a number of inclusive churches within London. I have to admit, I did feel drawn to the Church of England, um, possibly because um, these were simply the churches um, which were closest to my office um, to my office where, uh, where I worked these were the churches that I initially visited mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of LGBTQ plus people sadly they have experienced rejection uh, by the Church of England and I, I I have a number of friends who have had very, very difficult 
experiences with the Church of England. However, most of my experiences have been very positive. Um, as I said earlier, I think that could be because I was living in London. So I was able to choose the churches that I went to. I was able to dip into lots of different churches and experience them. And I didn't necessarily visit them with particular expectations. I was looking to explore. Uh, it probably was my experiences at St. John's, which, um, which cemented my relationship with the Church of England, mm -hmm. in that Giles encouraged me uh, to be confirmed uh, in, in 2015, and that was within a Church of England cathedral, uh, Southwark Cathedral. Uh, Southwark Cathedral, in, it, interestingly, it, it also has the UK's only HIV AIDS shrine. So it seemed as if two aspects of my identity, my faith and my HIV, were being brought together. And that was a really special and crucial moment for me. I would say from that point onwards, I couldn't really envisage worshipping within another denomination. Um, back in 2012, 2013, I did, I did visit um, churches which were a part, which were, uh, which were part of other Christian denominations. Okay. And, uh, yeah, Phil, I'm just, I'm just mindful of time. It's fascinating talk to, talking to you, but I want to just get down into some of the nitty gritty of some of the politics of the church, if we can. So, you know, you, so you were confirmed a, a number of years ago now, and, and you are uh, an activist and, I was um, obviously I was doing a bit of research and, and you did write in the gay times that you felt that the LGBT Christians are second class citizens in the church. Do you still believe that or, or are you encouraged or where, where are you in the whole situation in terms of um, LGBT people and, and more and 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 the church? Do you think we're heading in the right direction or, or do you think we're in for stormy waters? So. As I said, I think, I think my experiences as an LGBTQ Christian, uh, they've almost been quite unique because I've been able to select the churches that I visit, but that isn't the same situation. I would go as far to say for most LGBTQ plus Christians uh, within the Church of England, uh, a lot of people, a lot of LGBTQ plus people do feel excluded by the church. And I think that's something that we really need to change. We need a Church of England, which is really a national church, a church that is fit for everyone, uh, regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of disability and also regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. We're all uniquely and beautifully made in God's image. And I don't think that's something which is currently recognized by the Church of England. I think there have been encouraging signs. So I, I was really pleased last year when the, the church of Wales um, decided to approve same-sex blessings. It's my dream one day to get married to another man within a Church of England church. I am, I'm probably more, a little bit more patient than some of my LGBTQ plus Christian friends who have 
experienced more rejection from the Church of England. I would hope that over the next five years, the Church of England can at least come, come to a place where we can have blessings within Church of England churches. And I would hope that one day um, the Church of England can endorse uh, same-sex marriage. For me, that's something that is really important. But what I, I think we do need to come to a position on that, but it does need to be done in a way where everyone's views are considered. Uh, the living in, in, in love and faith process, uh, some of your listeners uh, uh, who aren't from a Church of England background may not know what that is. Uh, th th that was initiated around 2017 and it was designed so that people um, from who have lots of different views on sexual orientation and gender identity could discuss those. Um, that's been going on since 2017. Hopefully that's going to come to a conclusion um, within, uh, within the next 12 months or so. And I would like to think that the General Synod can, can really make some progress in that area. I'd like to see a Church of England where every LGBTQ plus person is welcomed and affirmed for who they are. Yes, thank you, Philip. And I just want to, um, I want to ask a question about sex. Um, so what is your position in, so you've talked with real kind of eloquence and, and enthusiasm uh, for Giles, an openly gay man and priest, but a man who, who is not, who effectively is not allowed to enjoy the joy of a sexual union. What's your, what's your take on that? I find, I find it quite weird that the church appears to one of the unique places where you have to kind of describe your sexual orientation. And then if you, if you declare that you're a gay man, that you then have to say, well, I promise not to have sex, which seems utterly ridiculous to me. What, what's your view on that, Philip? Well, I have to admit, I, I think the Church of England generally spends far too much time uh, talking uh, talking uh, about sex. I, I think it's an incredibly difficult position for Church of England priests um, in that, uh, for LGBTQ plus priests, in that whilst they're able to be in relationships, um, they, are, they have to go through a formula whereby um, their, um, their, they're not meant to, to engage in, in sexual relationships. And it, 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 it is really a, a very awkward situation. For myself personally, um, my goal is to have a, a long-term monogamous relationship. I'm, I'm currently single, so I'm, I'm not necessarily faced with some of these challenges directly. Um, however, um, I do hope to meet that special person. Um, as a lay member uh, of the congregation, I'm not faced with the same challenges that, um, that, a mem that, that uh, an LGBTQ plus member of the clergy is. But I think really there needs to be less focus on sex within the Church of England and more focus on 
uh, LGBTQ people being welcomed and and affirmed. Mm. Thank you, Philip. We're almost out of time, but I'm just wondering, uh, just regarding these matters, what what you feel Jesus would make of it all? What do you what do you what do your your personal feeling? What Jesus would make of these these discussions that are raging in the church at the moment? Uh, well, my own view is that Jesus would be at the front of every LGBTQ plus or gay rights march. If you look at the New Testament, Jesus is consistently fighting for the disenfranchised within our society. Um, If you look at his miracles, in each of his miracles, he seeks to include a previously excluded group um, within the, uh, within the, 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 he seeks to show that, that they are a valid part of um, of uh, of God's creation, that they are worthy of love. Um, Jesus's message was one of love. He doesn't want people to be excluded, and um, I think in increasingly churches. Um, around the world um, or a a number of churches around the world are recognizing that. Um, Jesus's message is is one of love um, and he wouldn't want LGBTQ plus people excluded from uh, from that. I'm I'm really certain of that. So that's uh, perhaps a, a wonderful way to end this godcast and thank you for your openness and your honesty and your story of um from it being a young man to becoming a faithful christian um thank you so much for coming on the godcast philip thank you it's been a real pleasure and honor thank you um, it's it, it, it's been a real privilege to be interviewed by you and thank you for asking such such insightful and interesting questions Thank you, Philip. God bless and um, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much.